Hey everybody, this is the second video in a three-part series on category theory. Before watching this video, be sure to watch the previous video which introduces categories. You can find a link in the description. The goal of this video is to introduce functors and look at several examples from functional programming. So let's get started. Categories allow us to study functors. For categories C and D, a covariant functor, also just called a functor, F from C to D, maps objects in C to objects in D, and maps arrows f from A to B in C to arrows f of f from f of A to f of B in D. Additionally, f preserves or respects composites and identities in C. This is all just to say that f maps the category C into the category D while preserving or respecting the category theoretic structure in C. It's easier to visualize what's happening in a diagram. On the left, we have our familiar commutative triangle in C. F goes from A to B, G goes from B to C, and the composite G after F goes from A to C, making the triangle commute. On the right, we have the image of that commutative triangle under F in D. Here, F of F goes from F of A to F of B, F of G goes from F of B to F of C, and F of G after F is the composite F of G after F of F, going from F of A to F of C and making the triangle commute. We see that F creates a diagram of shape C in D. A contravariant functor f from c to d is just a covariant functor f from the dual category c op to d. Recall from the previous video that the dual category c op is obtained by formally reversing the arrows in c. This means if f is an arrow from a to b in c, then f of f is an arrow to f of a from f of b in d, so f reverses the direction of arrows. Again, this is easier to see in a diagram. On the left, we have the familiar commutative triangle in C. On the right, we have the image of that commutative triangle under F in D. As you can see, F reverses the direction of arrows. Just like categories, functors are everywhere. We now look at some examples. First, consider the power set functor P in the category of sets. It maps a set A to its power set P of A, that is, the set of all subsets of A. It maps a function F from A to B to the function p of f from p of a to p of b, defined like this. This function maps a subset x of a to its image under f, as we can see in a diagram. Here we have the set a on the left and the set b on the right. The function f maps elements of a to elements of b. The function p of f maps subsets of a to subsets of b by applying f to the elements in those subsets of a. Another way to describe this is that P lifts the action of F on elements of A to subsets of A. It's easy to verify that P is a functor. We'll see another example like this later on. First, we revisit the lambda calculus, which we introduced in the previous video. In the lambda calculus, and most programming languages, functions are covariant in their output types. This means if B is a subtype of C, then for any type A, the type of functions from A to B is a subtype of the type of functions from A to C. For example, a function having type str to int also has type str to num, since int is a subtype of num. In other words, a function which returns integers is also a function which returns numbers, since integers are numbers. In the language of category theory, this is equivalent to saying that the type constructor a arrow blank is a covariant functor in the category of types under subtyping. Let's pause for a moment to unpack this. Recall from the last video that the arrow here acts as a type constructor. Given two types, A and B, it returns a new type, namely the type of functions from A to B. If we fix the input type A and let the output type vary, we get a new type constructor, which we denote by A arrow blank. Given a type B, which gets inserted into the blank, this constructor returns the type of functions from A to B. Covariance of output types means this constructor is a covariant functor. Indeed, the covariance condition for output types just says that this constructor preserves subtype relations, which are the arrows in the category of types under subtyping. So category theory elegantly describes this property of functions in programming. Duly, functions are contravariant in their input types. If B is a subtype of C, then for any type A, the type of functions from B to A is a supertype of the type of functions from C to A. As an example, a function having type num to num also has type int to num, since int is a subtype of num. In other words, a function which takes numbers as inputs 
is also a function which takes integers as inputs, since integers are numbers. In the language of category theory, this is equivalent to saying that the type constructor blank arrow a is a contravariant functor. Here we are fixing the output type a in the arrow type constructor and letting the input type vary to get the new type constructor blank arrow a. Contravariance of input types means this constructor reverses subtype relations, that is, it converts subtype relations to supertype relations, and is therefore a contravariant functor. This is our first example of duality appearing in the wild. Let's look at another example, slightly more complicated. In many programming languages, given a list of a's and a function f from a's to b's, you can map the function over the list to obtain a list of b's. Here's an example in Haskell, where we're mapping the length function over a list of strings to produce the list of string lengths. This line of code evaluates to true. Now, I know what the programmers in the audience are thinking. How did I manage to integrate the solarized dark theme so beautifully into this slide presentation? Well, it takes a little work. It's not a one-step process. You've got to value the aesthetics of your presentation. Moving on. There are two ways of looking at this example. The first is that we're passing both the length function and the list of strings to the map function, which in turn applies the length function to each string in the list and returns the list of string lengths. The second, more interesting way of looking at this example is to think of map length as a function by itself. This function takes in a list of strings and returns the list of string lengths. More generally, for any function f from a's to b's, map f is a function from lists of a's to lists of b's. It applies f to each element in a list of a's to obtain a list of b's. So map lifts the action of f on a's to lists of a's. This should seem familiar to you from the example of the power set functor earlier. It shouldn't be surprising that there's a functor lurking here too. Indeed, all of this just means that the list type constructor list blank, together with map, is a covariant functor in the category of types and functions. Recall in this category the arrows are functions, not subtype relations. Given a type A, this constructor returns the type list of A's, and given a function F from A's to B's, map returns the lifted function map F from lists of A's to lists of B's. Again, the language of category theory nicely describes this behavior. The question naturally arises, can we generalize this beyond lists? How about mapping a function over a tree? For example, can we map the length function over the following tree of strings to produce a tree of string lengths? The answer is yes, if we specify how to lift a function up a tree. To illustrate this, we walk through a complete implementation in Haskell. On the first line of code, we define a tree data type. Here, tree is a type constructor, and a is a type variable for the constructor. The variable will allow us to create different types of trees, like trees of strings and trees of integers. On the right-hand side of this line of code, we define the value or data constructors for trees, which we will use to actually construct trees. There are two constructors. The leaf constructor, which allows us to create a leaf of a tree containing a single value of type A, and the node constructor, which allows us to create a node of a tree containing two subtrees. We can use these two constructors to build arbitrarily complicated trees. The next few lines of code are where the magic happens. Here we're indicating that our new type constructor tree is a functor. We do this by specifying how to lift a function up a tree. More specifically, we make tree an instance of the functor type class by providing a definition for the fmap function on trees. The fmap function is just like the map function we saw earlier, except it works with any functorial type, not just lists. So how do we map a function over a tree? It's simple. If we're at a leaf, just apply the function to the value in the leaf. If we're at a node with subtrees, just recursively map the function over the subtrees. That's it. With those few lines of code, our tree type is functorial. Now we can actually implement the example described on the previous slide. We first define the input tree with strings in the leaves. We next produce the output tree by mapping the length function over the input tree, using fmap. Finally, we see that the output tree contains the string lengths, as desired. The final line of code evaluates to true. So, apart from this silly example, why is this pattern actually useful? Why would we want to define functorial types in practice? One reason is that it allows us to avoid writing the same type of code over and over. Rather than writing one function to perform an operation on the elements of a list, and another function to perform essentially the same operation on the elements of a tree, 
and additional functions to perform essentially the same operation on other, more complicated types, we can just define the operation once, and then lift it to any functorial type. The pattern also allows greater separation of concerns. A functorial type need not concern itself with the details of the particular operations that may be applied to values of that type, only with how an operation gets lifted, practically speaking, with how the data type gets traversed. On the other hand, we can define generic operations, which need not concern themselves with the idiosyncrasies of particular data types. This allows us to write very powerful, concise code. And it's all described elegantly by category theory. That concludes this video on functors. Stay tuned for the next video where we dive a little deeper into category theory and study universal properties.